is 2 Timothy for uh, today. And if someone's got a question, I'd rather take the question than, uh, than any other thing. <coughs> and we have uh, principally Troy and myself on our YouTube account, but we're getting ready very likely to put uh, some more folks on there. David Sharp and Ben Sharp, uh, most likely in the next week or so, we'll have them, their Bible class on there also, if a person would like to uh, get to it. And of course, we got Dave Rummer. I tried to get Dave to come back again, but we haven't been able to get Dave to uh, come back and give another class, but he could give some excellent ones. Okay, second Timothy, I'm already on the other camera. This camera's already going. All right. Uh, 2 Timothy. All right, as, uh, as Paul was finishing up his ministry, his last book that I can tell that he wrote through the, through the Holy Spirit was, was the book of Timothy, 2 Timothy. Timothy was a young man that Paul met in Lystra on his second missionary journey. And he's a young fellow. And when Paul <coughs> taught him and preached to him, and Timothy trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior based on the message that Paul was able to give to him. So you see that Timothy is referred to him as my son in the faith. So, so that's good. Timothy also, his mother was a Jew, Jewish lady, and his grandmother was a Jewish lady. Their name was Lois and Eunice, and they studied the scriptures and they taught their son and grandson uh, the Bible. Uh, as I mentioned it in the past, my granddad had some influences on me back when I was a youngster. I'm sure he didn't know it, and it only lasted just a very short period of time. But he was a Christian man, loved the Lord, and studied his Bible. And the few comments he made when I was a youngster uh, stuck with me forever. And, and we can go back. It's kind of amazing. All the things that go through our mind but what what things stick stick in there. Uh, it's kind of unreal what really sticks. Okay, so that's that's Timothy. So Paul, Timothy stuck with Paul and went with him on his missionary journeys and was a great worker for, for the for Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul used him and needed him very much. So Paul now is sitting in prison. He realizes that he's probably going to get killed not too far in the future. And he's writing a letter to Timothy. And Timothy evidently is sitting in Asia, which is our Turkey. And he's sitting over there, and Paul's telling him, Hey, look, winter's coming. And I left a coat in Troas. I want you to go by there and get that coat and bring it to me real quickly because it's getting ready to get cold. He also told him, Hey, there's some books there I want you to bring with you. But most importantly, I want you to bring some scrolls. And evidently those scrolls were Old Testament Bible. So he wanted all that to brought, be brought to him while he was in prison. And so this is a letter that he's writing to uh, Timothy. And if you have a question about where something is in the scripture that has to do with the Pauline epistles, it's most likely in Romans chapter 8. If it's not in Romans chapter 8, you can probably find it in 2 Timothy. So let's, let's read together and and y'all help me come help with all this as we go through this. Second Timothy. We'll read it and we'll talk about certain things as we walk through there. Lots of things in Second Timothy. I encourage you to when you get home tonight and next week and always is sit down and go through Second Timothy real slowly, real carefully, and meditate on what God says. Chapter one. Second Timothy chapter one. And as we walk through there, I'll put in a, a few of the highlights uh, on what's, what we'll be looking at if we get that far. Uh, my son, he's Paul's son in the faith, meaning he was saved. Unfraid faith, which is uh, sincere faith. We'll see that mentioned. Not ashamed. Paul tells him, don't be ashamed. Paul says, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul is absolutely persuaded, and so is Timothy, that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Uh, sound words, what we're, what we're to do with sound words, we're to teach others, we're to endure, we're to strive lawfully, we're to study, we're sealed, depart from iniquity, we're to purge ourselves from certain peoples, 
We are to flee youthful lust. And it talks about the last days. All these topics are in 2 Timothy, and we obviously won't be able to cover them real thoroughly. But let's, let's, let's take a look at them and, and, and see what it says. All right, so 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. And that life, of course, is eternal life. To, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God who I, who I serve uh, from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. So Paul obviously played, prayed for this young man, and this young man would end up being doing some of the things that we got on the board. So London I and Alan have, have a little Bible class every night, and we pray for uh, certain individuals every single night for somebody. Okay, and that's good. We all need to be praying for each other because and we certainly because we all need it for the wiles of the devil. Uh, verse four. Of greatly, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Of course, Paul wanted to see Timothy. He had a love for Timothy. He had a great concern for Timothy. He prayed for Timothy. And they had tears of joy together. Verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unframed faith that is in thee. And that, that faith there is sincere faith. Sincere faith that Paul, that Timothy had. Which dwelt first in thy grandmother, Lois, and thy mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded that then thee also. So we say, when we read these things, it's not only Paul through the Holy Spirit talking to Timothy, but it's God talking to you and I about us. So when we read through here, I try to envision, hey, God talking to me. And that's what he obviously is doing. Verse 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that those that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee, by the putting on of my hands. Now, at this time, Paul is in prison. We'll see this in a few minutes. He's up in Rome. He's in prison. And Paul doesn't have the sign gifts anymore. At one time, during the book of Acts, Paul healed people. He, he himself was healed from a snake bite. He could, he could do all kind of things. But when God cut Israel off in our calendar, 70 A.D., then Paul didn't, didn't have those gifts. So what he's talking about here is like a handshake. Uh, they hugged each other and kissed each other on the cheeks, evidently. So that's what I think he's referring to there. In verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. There's a verse in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and to the Greek. Alan, in that verse there, why did they say to the Jew first? Because they were first. That's right. They were first during the Acts period. Anytime Paul went to a city, who's, who's the people he searched out first? The Jews. And the Jews required a sign, and God gave them a sign. And if we go back to Romans chapter 11 and look at that olive tree, it appears to me that God was giving those people an opportunity to accept the message, and when the Jews rejected it, they cut that limb off. And, and then he said, I turned to the Gentiles in that city. Then he'd go to the next city and go to the Jew first again. All right, verse, uh, verse 9. Let's do verse 8 again. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. I know when I went to college, my mom, of course I, I commuted back and forth from home to college for three years. The last year I lived on campus, and my mom gave me a Bible to take with me to school. Do you know where I put that Bible? In the furthest back shelf in the closet of my, 
in the dorm. Because why? I was ashamed. I wasn't the saved at that time. I was ashamed of it. So we think about ourselves. Are we ashamed? Are we ashamed to walk around with a Bible? Are we ashamed to witness to people? Are we ashamed to let folks know that, hey, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, God tells us, don't be ashamed. You know, there's some verse in uh, Ezekiel, I think, chapter 7, I believe, somewhere right in there. It talks about, God tells Ezekiel, don't worry about their looks when they look at you when you talk to them. Don't worry about what they say. You just let them know that a prophet has been amongst them when you leave. And you do it with gentleness, and we're getting ready to see it in a few moments, and with charity. But let them know where you stand. Don't be ashamed. Now for me, his prisoner. See, there's a prisoner. If you want to know which which epistles are prison epistles, God will identify them. Either <coughs> you'll say prison or in bonds or something. So, Alan, what's, what's the significance of the prison epistles? Anybody want to help him? I didn't give you a long enough. I know you know the answer. Ma'am? He was in prison when you wrote him. Okay, that's good. That's obvious. That's right. What else? What's doctrinally? What's what's important that about knowing that? That was when he was doctrinally was going to the Jew. That the Jew, there's no difference. All right, he, he, at that time, the Jews had been cut off. The, evidently, the temple had been destroyed. The people of the prince had come in to destroy the temple and the sanctuary and scattered the Jews all over the world. Jerusalem was torn down. And so therefore God had cut Israel off. That last limb of that olive tree had been cut off. So therefore, Paul, they, they were cut off. So there's, so in Paul was in prison and he had the mystery of Ephesians chapter 2 and 3 where God was not dealing with the Jews as his chosen people anymore. So therefore, Paul was not as under the law. He did not obey the ordinances. That's the reason why we don't obey the ordinances today. It's because God is not dealing with the Jews as chosen people. Otherwise, we would. There's an individual that comes to our Bible classes some. He has a friend that goes to a particular church. And this is a Jewish church. They suppose to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They call them Masonic Jews, I believe. But they obey the ordinances. They're there doing all these ordinances and doing all these things. And in the mystery that's in the prison epistles of Paul says, no, we don't do that anymore. God's cut the Jews off. There's no more signed gifts. That's not applicable. And we get that real loud and clear in Colossians where Paul tells us the ordinances have been nailed to the cross. They're over with. Will they come back again in the future? Yes. When but God the, starts dealing with the Jews as his chosen people again. But the Jews could also be saved. Like There's no them. difference between anybody getting saved today. It don't matter what your background is, what your color is, it don't matter anything. We're all one blood, and God says in order to be saved today, we have to have faith in Jesus Christ's work and is shedding me his blood on the cross, realizing that I'm a sinner, and all my righteousnesses are filthy rags. So there's no difference. Okay? All right, verse uh, 8 again. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be, but be thou partaker of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God. Did Paul have afflictions? Did people beat him up and stone him and all kind of problems? We think we go through some kind of affliction because one of our relatives or something or somebody else will say something ugly about us. That doesn't hurt. Sticks and stones. So that doesn't hurt. We don't, we don't know what afflictions are. There are people in the world are getting their heads chopped off, getting all kind of horrible things done to them because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And it's going to be more widespread and it also occurred in the United States one of these days. Verse 9. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. Now see, here's the, here's the mystery given to Paul. That you and I can be saved in a, in a moment, and, and, it, and we are sealed, and we are justified, and we get the blood atonement immediately. 
Okay? And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So Paul tells us that in Romans and a lot of places that we get that immediately. But that's not the gospel that was given to Peter and the twelve. That's called the gospel of what? Circumcision. They had to endure to the end, be water baptized, do good works, do all kinds of things, and they didn't get the blood atonement until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 9. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. God knew your heart. He knew my heart before the world began. He didn't dictate our actions. He just knew what they were. We are predestined based on foreknowledge, it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Before the world began. Isn't that something? All right, verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath, also, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Through, <coughs> through death, through His death, Jesus Christ died, and we can't possibly understand all that. He died for us. He took our sins. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that he became sin for us and paid the penalty for you and I. And if we have faith in that, God will account us as dead also. Our sins, if we accept him, our sins are considered paid for. They're dead. They're gone. They're over with. But we're reading a moment that doesn't give us license to live any way we want to and get away with it. That won't work. Verse 11. Wherein too I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of who? The Gentiles. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 15, in Romans chapter 8, that he's the apostle to the Gentiles. Who was the twelve apostles to? Anybody? To the house of Israel, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go not into the way of the Gentiles. In any city of Samaritan, do you not? We go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so therefore, in, in Jesus Christ told them in Matthew 28, all the things I wrote and told you, 12, I want you to do with practice. And people today, they go back and, and they pull all that up and try to make that to be doctrine correct for you and I today. It won't work. Verse 11. Where? Where is it? Uh, Verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And there would be a day of judgment for each one of you and I. But we're persuaded what God says in this book is true. The most important book I own is the King James Bible. When we go out and shop or go somewhere, I always take the Bible with me so I can read it when I get a chance. If this house caught on fire, I'd get London out and out first, and I'd be grabbing this particular Bible on the way out the door. Why? Because it's got notes in it that, that I depend upon and I need and I want. And it's not just because of the book. The book is just ink and pages. But it's His Word that's in there. And, and some of the notes that I put in there are valuable <coughs> for me. So I, I suggest, get your, have your Bible. I like the wide margin Bibles so I can write my own notes in it as I study and go through there. That's very, very helpful for me. Okay. Uh, let's, let's go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Philippians is another prison epistle. Philippians 1, verse 6. These are extremely powerful words. I couldn't say them better than God, so that's the reason why we read them. Philippians 1, verse 6 says, Being confident. How do you get confidence? How, do you, how are you persuaded? By faith to begin with. God 
convicts you and I <coughs> that we are sinful creatures. God convicts you and I that there is a God. He lets us know through nature and things there is a God and there is a time to be born and there's a time to die. Something's true. So this, this book is written words are the things that gives me decision, <coughs> that gives me confidence. God tells us in Romans chapter uh, 9 that, that uh, I can't quote it, that we get faith by the word of God. Somebody get that verse. Hearing, hearing by the word of God. Yeah, hearing by the, faith cometh by hearing, mm-hmm. and hearing by the word of God. So you won't get too much out of me talking today. You'll get a whole lot if you go home and take your Bible and turn to 2 Timothy chapter, 2 Timothy and start reading it real slow. Meditate on what you read. Don't read just words. Think about the words that we, we read. Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. What we are like when a person accepts Jesus Christ by faith as their Savior, God calls him as a little child. And as that child <coughs> continues to feed on God's Word, God, you become stronger, you'll be persuaded, you'll be stand up more in public and talk to friends and relatives. You'll have more confidence and do that. And God said He'll be with you, He'll help us, and He'll and encourage us to do that all the way to the day of Christ Jesus. And that is to the day we die, or to the judgment seat of Christ. They will be a judgment. It doesn't matter what I think or anybody else thinks. This Bible is true. Lots of people that come to know the Lord based on different avenues. Some people come to know the Lord based on prophecy. They see these things happening and say, man, that, that, how could that happen? This has got to, Who can do all this? It's got to be God. Other people get so far down, I'll just say in the gutter, that hey, they realize, hey, they realize they're a sinner. Like Troy said the other night, the majority of folks don't realize they're sinners. And you and I don't realize how sinful we are until we're saved. And then we realize all of our righteousnesses are filthy rags, that the only thing that's righteous was the Lord Jesus Christ. He became our sin, He was without sin, and He willingly took our, took our punishment on the cross. So there's another verse in Philippians 2.16 that says, Holding firm the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Holding firm God's word. Memorize God's word. Read God's word. God tells us to renew our minds day by day. Because we can get astray. We can let the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches make us to be unfruitful. So we all have that battle. So God says we need to be reading God's Word every single day. Holding forth the Word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Because when the day of Christ comes, that's when he, we get our rewards. There's a, a old black man years and years ago had a sermon. He says... Uh, what did he say? He says uh, it had to do with payday is coming. Some, payday, some, Sunday. Payday, Sunday. Sunday. Fridays are coming. And That's what it was. Payday, payday, Sunday. Mm-hmm. Fridays are coming. So where were they? Payday. People used to get paid on Friday. So paydays are coming. Fridays on the way. And it will be. And we went out to eat with a man this this week is 94 years old. He's, uh, his mind is, is, is leaving him pretty quickly. But there's one thing he hadn't left him, and that is love for the Lord Jesus Christ in that. And he realizes that paydays are coming, and it will be. And so he kept saying, 94 years old? How could it have been gone that, that, by that fast? You know, I'm getting old. <laughs> that was right, Carson. Uh, okay, uh, where did we get to? Uh, uh, That's 2.16. Okay, let's go. Let's go back to 2 Timothy. And we're about in verse 12. Let's go to verse 13. 
Verse 13 says, Hold fast the form of sound words. How do you know what sound words are? Look up to the Bible and read them. And compare this spiritual things with spiritual. Don't just pick one verse and try to build doctrine on it. Get all the verses that have to do with that subject. And don't let anybody persuade you from God's Word. Ask God to give you the understanding. I know years ago, there's a friend of mine, I always felt intimidated being around me because he's always quoting scripture and he's always doing this. And I, wasn't up, I wasn't with it. And after a while, I realized, well, he's really only talking about a handful of verses. Sure, I can go get them verses. And God told Daniel, in Daniel chapter 10, about verse 13, he says, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou set thy heart to understand God's word, that he would give him that understanding. And he did. So, so uh, if we wanted, we could get it. But we, we have to. God said he had to, uh, uh, what's the verse? He had to put his body in subjection. He had to really want it to get it. And he got it. <clears throat> All right, verse uh, 14. What chapter? Uh, 2 Five. Timothy chapter 1. 1. <clears throat> that good thing which was committed unto me, thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. So Paul was given some very important message by Jesus Christ. And it was committed unto him. And Paul gave that to Timothy. Okay? So Timothy, he's telling Timothy to you keep what I gave you. Compare it with Scripture and you share it with others. Now turn to uh, 1 Timothy 1.11. First Timothy 1.11. Now, God, things happen to us are planned from the beginning of the world. Okay. And God has committed to us certain Bible truths that I guarantee you, you have to go a good ways to find other folks that, that God has given this message to. And so we're to treat it that way and we're, we're to share it to other people. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was co committed... To my trust. We have been given things that's committed to you and I, and we need to give all, do all our strength to get it out to other people. Take a look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. That don't sound right. I think it's 1 Timothy 2, 4. Not Thessalonians, man. I meant Thessalonians, Thessalonians. It's 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 4. Thank you, sir. But as we were allowed of God. Now you think about that, man. We read these verses sometime real quickly, or I do, and don't let them sink in. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God, which tried our hearts. Boy, that's a super verse, isn't it? So, so you and I have been giving the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are to share with other people. There's no accident. There's no accident. God tells us that we that we're to have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what we are to be about. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Okay, uh, verse Let's go to verse 15. Uh, this thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, uh, of whom are Phagelius and Hermonius. I can't pronounce this word. These two guys, folks. They turned away. So, uh, 
I, the Bible class that we've been involved with over the years, there's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people come in one door, stay a week or two, and out the back door, and they turned away. Some people stayed longer. They said, well, what are they, what's the difficulty? Well, normally the difficulty is they either, they're being pulled away by the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, or mama, or daddy, or somebody else, and not putting their faith in what God said. Put your faith in the King James Bible, God's Word. And God says, study it, and look at it, and if you make up your uh, heart that you want it, God will let you have it. Uh, verse 16. The Lord give mercy unto the house of uh, on this for us, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Second Timothy chapter 2. So the chain, so he's in prison. Verse 17. But well, wait he, a second. Now, just a minute ago you said those so which are in Asia. Uh, that's now, 2 Timothy 1.15. That's right. Now that I'm, I'm trying to be back in 2 Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. Okay. I won't go through those guys' names again. I'll kill them. We're not to be ashamed of my chain. Verse 17 of 2 Timothy 1. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. So these folks came up and found uh, Paul in prison and went to visit him and helped him. Verse 18, the Lord granted to him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day and how many and in how many things uh, he ministered unto me at Ephesus, uh, thou knowing very well. Again, we're going to chapter 2 and I say we're not going to finish all the things that I'm about to go into. Uh, I may, well, let this start out, we'll start out in chapter 2. Thou, therefore, my son, and he is his son in the faith, thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Okay, all right, especially as Scarlet leaves, she's going to have a great opportunity to talk to all kind of folks that has not heard this, I'm sure. So God entrusts you with getting that done. They, those folks, God will give you the honor of being able to teach some of those people and some of them getting to be your brother and sisters in Christ. That, that lasts for eternity. <clears throat> Look at verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Hardness. Because we get ready to read, read in a minute that everybody that lives godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer some kind of persecution. It, it's not much for us yet today, but it will be. Verse 4. No man that warth entangling himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet, it is, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. If we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we see that we're going to be judged based on what sort our works are. It's got to be as, as Paul laid out for you and I. That's the lawful way that you and I are to work for the Lord and to do for the Lord. It's in there. If you go out and teach people otherwise, to keep the ordinances, don't do this, don't eat, don't do that, don't do this, uh, be water baptized, be sprinkled, whatever, that's not lawful. That's not the lawfulness that God has given Paul. So it would be come to naught. It won't be right. Verse 6, The husband that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. You can't possibly go out and tell somebody how to be saved, <laughs> give them the mystery and all, and it's your first partaker of the fruit. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things, and he will. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead 
according to my gospel. It's Paul. He was raised from the dead. He shed his blood for the remission of our sins. And if we have faith in that fact, God says he will, he will save us. And I'm going, I'm going to skip some. And let's go to our famous verse in Ephesians, I mean, it's second, uh, Timothy chapter 2. Verse 15, it says, and you can quote it, Study the show thyself approved unto God, a workman that he did not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, we can spend years on, on, that, on this verse. Study. When we go out to take a, an exam in biology or calculus or whatever, you've got to study well, God says to study to show thyself approved unto, not your professor, but unto God. A workman. It don't come easy. I'd rather be doing something else. You folks today, there's all kinds of things you could be doing, but you're here. So it takes effort. It takes a lot of effort. Rightly dividing. you got to divide between Old Testament and New Testament, and that's not really correct. The New Testament doesn't start until the death of a testator. So really, the Old Testament went up to the cross, and the New Testament followed. But we realize that, that, that Jesus Christ cut Israel off because they wouldn't accept Him as the Messiah. He cut them off, interrupted Daniel's uh, seven weeks of prophecy, and put a mystery in there and gave it to Paul. And says, Paul, we aren't going to wait for the millennium until the Jews and go, go out and, and try to get the Gentiles into the into the church. We're going to get you to go ahead and do it now. He changed that ministry. He changed it and gave it to Paul. We did that in Romans chapter 15. So so you and I go get our doctrine from the Pauline epistles, Romans through Philemon. And there's a special part of it in the prison epistles in 2 Timothy is some of those, is part of the prison epistle. Alright, let's look at the next verse. But for but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase uh, unto more ungodliness. All right, this is a verse I want you pretty quick. I'm just going to read. Who concerning the truth have erred, seeing that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. So here's people teaching things that's not doctrine. If you want to learn about the resurrection, you are now a resurrection. You don't get it in Sunday school literature. You don't get it in books. You don't get it in magazines. You get it from God's Word, the King James Bible. So go in there and look at it talking about a resurrection. And it tells us, you and I, that we go out to the last trump. And so when God puts that in there, man, that's easy to understand. We go out to the last trump. Now where's the last trump? Where's the last trump? The last trump, either the last one in eternity, that's the last one, or the last one in the sea rays. And we know that there's trumpets blown out in eternity in a millennium in places. So therefore, it must be the last one in the sea reach. But people don't like that as an answer. But so they don't use God's Word to get that doctrine nailed down. Use God's Word to nail the doctrine down. Okay, so we go at the last trump. Uh, let's go to verse 21. Just because of, let's go to verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. So in a house, and it's not necessarily just talking about a residence, but, but in a community, in a group, or in a setting, or something, or UWF, wherever you want to come up with it, there's some vessels that's honorable, and there's some vessels that's not honorable. Verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and pre prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust. So we can think about that in a minute. We can probably figure out what all that is. Youthful lust. Okay? Part of youthful lust is, hey, it's not going to happen to me. I'm going to live forever. Everything's okay. If it feels good, do it. Don't care what God says. I got plenty of time to get things corrected. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness. Now we all 
come and fail in everyone in here. It, it gets every one of us. All our righteousnesses are filthy rags. That's the reason why we can be so thankful for Jesus Christ's work. That's the reason why we can be glorify the cross and not anything that we do. Verse 22. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. We are to pal, we are to associate with, our friends are to be other Christians that have pure hearts, that want God's truth. That's the people we are to pal with. I think about Daniel. Daniel was a magnificent man, had great faith, and, but he was second in command of probably about at least two big uh, nations that rule the world. And he was second in command. So therefore, he must have been real smart. He must have been, had a great capability to work with people in business. He had that capability. But he also never, ever let God down or let God's word or God's truth interrupt or interfere with his work for the government. Never did. Right, so, so that's what you and I should do. Verse 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they uh, do gender strife. There's all kind of good questions that people can ask and, and won't. But they ought to be sincere questions. Ask them. Ask me anything. Verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle with all men, apt to teach, be patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God preventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So when, so when you're talking with somebody about something, they may come up with something that uh, may be somewhat of a foolish question, and it's a question that you know you're probably not going to convince them that right at that moment. I'll give you an example, and you may agree or, or disagree. If someone says, the Lord audibly spoke to me, well, you know that's not correct. But if you just sit there and no, it didn't, yes, it did, no, it didn't, yes, it did, you're probably not going to get very aware. But if you just ignore that, you know, gentleness, teach them the gospel, teach them the truth, Teach them how to be saved. Don't let them divert you off. Teach them God's word, rightly dividing. They'll come to the conclusion that no, God speaks to us only through his word, the word of God. Now the Holy Spirit may remind you of the verse, and a verse may come to your mind, but he didn't come in and audibly say, Clint, go over and look at such and such. Not audibly. Okay? So we have, let's look at that again. Uh, verse 23. But foolishness and unlearned questions avoid, nor that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must be, but not strive. In other words, don't strive with people. But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience and meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves. If God preventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. For that they may uh, recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him and his will. So that's how he gets people. Gets them off on some tangent. Gets them off something that's not correct. Not having the King James Bible is, is being the basis and they all get fouled up. We can't go wrong by pointing out verses and saying, well, God says such and such right here. And let them read it. Quote it or let them read it. All right, chapter 3. Uh, this know also that in the latter days uh, perilous times shall come. Perilous times shall come. In the latter days or the last days, if you think about the earth being... 6,000 years. So the last days, we can find verses in Hebrews chapter 1 and other places, Acts chapter 2, that, that appears to be the last days were back then when Jesus Christ was on the earth. They're that, that long. So 
But but the two thousand years that's it's in the interruption period was not known then. So we talk about the last days, that period of time. So that period of time is compared to six thousand is not so many. But in the latter days, and they had problems back then, and there's certainly more perilous now than there were then, and they'll get worse and worse. When I was a child, uh, there might have been one couple in our community that we thought, those boys, thought that they were homosexual. That's a word that you wouldn't hardly say or quote, and you sure wouldn't want mom and daddy to hear you say that word, because that would just be an absolute no-no to say the word. Well, not today. Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? See, but today it's getting to be an acceptable term. It's being taught to children. They take the Ten Commandments out of the, out of the schools. You can't even worship God, but they'll teach other religions in school, in, in children and all. So what do you think this generation's in years to come is going to be? It's going to be very perilous. Verse chapter 3, verse 2 says, For men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, <coughs> proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, disobedience to parents. God tells us in the book of Proverbs how you are to discipline a child in love <coughs> despite their family. Okay, says, God gave you the child, that's why he's in love, not harshness, not in anger, not in torment or beating. But you can't do, you better not do that today or do it in public. You'd be thrown in jail. Okay? Disobedient to parents. And that's really what he does. He's disobedient children. Uh, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, which means lack of self-control, uh, fierce, despisers of those that are good, despisers of those that are good, traitors, high-minded, heady, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Well, that's an easy one to get us all trapped in, isn't it? And it does. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. For of the sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers lust, ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, we go to college, we go to school, we read books, we read all these kind of things. And we are ever learning, but not God's truth. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. Ever learning, and not able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Uh, when I went to college and uh, majored in engineering, I didn't have any difficulty with that kind of stuff in the engineering curriculum except electives. When I took English and literature and psychology and sociology, those kind of things, ooh, it was there. It was there. Not near as much as it is, I'm sure, today, but it was there. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Uh... Let's go to verse 12 of chapter 3. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions of some sort, of some degree, of some level. Uh, yes, in Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. <coughs> Let's read it again. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, grow worse and worse. So it does grow worse. It is getting worse. Deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. <coughs> so we learn things from, from the Bible. We learn things from Paul because Paul is the apostle 
to the Gentiles. Verse 15 of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. And, and that from a child, talking to Timothy, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So there's a verse in, in uh, Galatians that tells us what, you know, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so that's what we that's what we have to glory in. That's all we've got. Because all our righteousness is filthy rags. There's nothing else. God's power are in these words. So read them. I heard Dr. Ruckman, I heard Dr. Ruckman a few years ago. Commit yourselves to reading X number of pages in the Bible a day. Make it make it just like you eat breakfast or do something. I do it. And he said, if you read five pages a day, that's front and back, you'll read the Bible through in, in about six months, six to seven months. So we had a guy here this past week, a friend of mine asked him, how long have you been saved? How old are you? How many times have you read the Bible through? I'm not any, sir. And so that guy went home and took it to heart, and he read it through more than once. All right, for, uh, chapter, chapter 4. Now, this is a good verse. This is a try. This is a try here on the resurrection in the so-called rapture. But I charge thee, therefore, before God and Lord Jesus Christ, whom shall judge the quick and the dead in his appearing in his kingdom. There's a quick, meaning the people that are alive and the dead are going to be resurrected. And this verse tells us, tells me, that just like it says in Thessalonians and Corinthians, there's going to be an event in the future that the quick and the dead that are in Christ are going to be resurrected. And that point that they're going to be resurrected is at the last trump. And we learn, and we learn that that's that he is appearing in his kingdom. Go back and look at when the kingdom comes. According to the scripture, it comes at the seventh trumpet. So it all works out perfect. <coughs> you can't imagine the people I've seen and argued and fight over this verse. But don't, don't contend with them. Read the scripture. Let them see the scripture. And God's word is more powerful than and sharper than any two-edged sword. If God's word don't get it, then they've got a heart problem at the moment. But maybe one day in the future, they'll understand it. And that's what we need to pray for. Verse 2, chapter 4. Preach the word. Be instant in season. <clears throat> out of season. No, we do it all the time. Preach the word. Look for an occasion to preach God's word. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Of course, it, it talks to you and I first. If we're not partaker of the fruit first, we can't do this. And it's easy to reprove somebody. But when we judge somebody, we're judging ourselves also. It reproves, rebukes, and exhorts with all suffering. For the time will come <clears throat> when they will not endure sound doctrine. They won't go to Scripture for the doctrine. They'll go to whatever pleases the group. And it says in verse 6, I believe. No, let's, let's go ahead and keep reading verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. What will fill a, a group up or church up? Talk about football, talk about this, talk about that. Talk about goodness, talk about good works, talk about all kind of good things and good works especially. And a lot of those things are real good. They're just not doctrine. They're not sound doctrine. <clears throat> so teach sound doctrine. Verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul realized that he was getting ready to be killed or depart. So he's writing this last letter to Timothy. Go back and read verse 5. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of the evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, and make full proof of the time that God gives us. <coughs> Excuse me, because we won't, we won't always have it. It will, like this 94-year-old guy says, you know, I'm getting old. And he can't remember a lot of things now, but he can remember all about his salvation. God, had, he hasn't lost that. 
verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have, I have finished my course. I have kept <coughs> the faith. So that's what Paul is telling Timothy. <coughs> if we go down and read the rest of the chapter, Paul's, Paul's end up telling him, Hey man, Luke's with me. There's hardly anybody left with me. All the folks in Asia has turned against me, but I'm not giving up. Because I am persuaded that this King James Bible is true, and I am persuaded that Jesus is the Messiah, and that I'm a wicked, sinful person, <clears throat> and I have to trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And there is eternity, there is a death, there is a great pleasure in living it, in living it for the Lord. And God tells us, I don't have time to read the verses, but God tells us that, uh, let's go look at one of them right quick. It's in, um, see the first or second Corinthians, <clears throat> chapter 6. Let me get it right quick. Yeah, first Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 12. <coughs> I'll end up yeah, I'll stop in on this verse. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, God wants us to be ambassadors. We are ambassadors whether we like it or not if people see us as, as Christians. If Sully would have went out there to work and, and cursed and kicked and pitched a fit and wouldn't work and laid around and cheated and all kind of garbage, uh, he would not have very much of an audience that would listen to him when he tried to give the gospel out. So we're ambassadors. So God tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Which means, if I'm, if I'm saved <coughs> and sealed, I can't lose my salvation. God doesn't want us to just live anyway. He wants us to have a good ambassadorship and be able to have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants us to be able to teach them. Our okay. message is reconciliation. Reconciliation. And ambassadors. That's right. Uh, the twelve have another message that was different from that one. That's right. <coughs> okay, anybody comment, input? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Alan, get the camera for us. <coughs> 